CPU cores. And if you start running 10 Ruby's typical MRI instances that are about a gigabyte a piece, you hit severe memory pressure and you can't, probably can't utilize all the hardware, the compute hardware is there. So it's one of the really uh, essential, I think, elements of the future. So this, this, when I look towards the future, this is what I see. We have parallelism and concurrency. It's really essential that we take advantage of multi-core architecture or multi-CPU architecture. We have to be more efficient. We have to use the power that we have to get more done. We still need to work really hard. We need to do big tasks or people aren't going to be using Ruby. And we need to be really conscious of how much memory and how much storage we're using. So in that context, I think it's a fair question. Not, not many people ask this question, but it's a really fair question. Does Ruby have a future? Is it just a language that um, was interesting for web development and it had its little uh, spike in the history of computing and it's on decline? Many, many people think that that could be the case, right? There's a lot of contenders for um, uh, intellectual, what's the, not IP, but the other, the other intellectual thing. There's a lot of contenders for the brain power of people who are doing stuff. There used to be people hack, hacking out pretty amazing uh, solutions in Ruby and posting blogs about it. And over my time, I've seen this sort of dwindle. And now people are talking about Clojure, and they're talking about Scala, and they're talking about Node.js, and they're talking about Erlang. All of those languages, by the way, um, Julia, very interesting language. All of those languages have as one of their primary things, and functional programming in general, one of their primary um, advantages, one of the things that they promote is their ability to deal with concurrency. So let's look at Ruby for a little bit. <laughs> Ruby is kind of hippie, right? It's a dynamically typed language. It's like, hey, peace and love, throw me whatever object, right? It's more important how you behave than what thing you are, right? Which is actually pretty interesting. Words speak louder than, or uh, actions speak louder than words. So how an object behaves has a lot more than whether you typed integer in front of it or whether you typed array in front of it, right? But um, just like hippies in society, dynamically tight languages make some people really uncomfortable and they want to corral them in a you know, field somewhere and keep them sort of away from mucking up the, the efficient functioning of the rest of society. But hippies might be tolerable, but then you go even beyond that and you get downright reckless, right? We all know that eating something as delicious as that has got to be really bad for your health, right? So knowing that and being a responsible person, you are actually being sort of reckless by ingesting delicious, um, I don't even know exactly what that is, right? So Ruby has mutable state. And there are functional programming languages that are dynamically typed, but they're functional and they, you have to really wiggle around to do anything with mutable state, if at all, right? So in computer science, static typing and uh, an immutable state, this functional program, these are really the things that are important, right? And Ruby basically just <coughs> says whatever, free love, eat all you want, sort of things, right? However, not everybody who's looking at these hard problems is, um, I would say, as strict or as it takes as, as uh, down your nose view uh, of Ruby. There's a very interesting guy, Leslie Lamport, has hundreds, I swear, papers to his name. He starts this paper with, I am not an academic. It's a very, very, very interesting paper. This paper is on teaching concurrency. I'm not an academic, should be something that we, <laughs> I will preface some of my, my discussions with. Uh, he points out that despite the inherent simplicity of mathematics, it's almost as hard to write air-free mathematical descriptions of computa computations as it is to write air-free programs. Now, let's just reflect on that for a moment. If you've been in the company of people who are um, major proponents of uh, functional programming, like if you would go to, say, a Portland State um, colloquium rec lecture or something like this, that's a little bit different message than you typically hear. He goes on to say that incorrectly writing 
just something as simple as greater than rather than greater than equal to in the statement of a theorem is considered in mathematics to be a trivial mistake. Oops, forgot that. Okay, now we're greater than or equal to. However, off by one could be a very serious error in your program, right? Cause your program to crash, open some huge security vulnerability. So it's interesting to consider that. And one of the things that I see, this is a fabulous book. If you get a chance, please do take a look at it. It's a, it's a compendium of tons of different biases. And uh, one, of the, one of the ones that we encounter every day is called the confirmation bias. It's very rare that when we have a prized viewpoint on something that we actually look for disconfirming evidence. We actually look for ways that that might be wrong. We're very attuned to the ways that it might be right. So as a functional programmer, I'm like, wow, look how cool I did this program. It was really easy. But we don't look at the ways that our position on that might be wrong. So I present, I present this basically to consider um, whether Ruby is such a bad language for allowing dynamic typing and mutable state. And I relate this to um, this idea of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Sometimes this, this uh, example is used to illustrate how an algorithm might work. So you write down all the steps to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? Imagine describing making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. How many functional programming, uh, functional programming language programmers are here today? A few. <laughs> a few. So I've never seen a functional description of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's fairly easy to describe to almost anybody, including a child who's just beginning to be able to manipulate some of this stuff, that you do this step, and then you do this step, and then you do this step. And you can look at each one of those steps as a series of states, right? The bread is not on the table. So putting the bread on the table, the next state, the bread is on, or the next step, the bread is on the table. So you can look at this as a series of states, which if you look at Leslie Lamport's paper, Teaching Concurrency, that's what he sort of looks at. He says computation is really about a series of states in a relation that maps the transition from one state to the next. And to that, we add the very important idea of correctness. And correctness is a predicate that's true at every state. So when you look at something like that, you can see how you might describe uh, computation and even concurrent computation by looking at a series of states. So now we have a bunch of people making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And a functional programmer might look at that and say, oh, yay, PMAP, right? But there's another way that you might look at that. Each one of those people are individual. They're not sharing state, but they're doing their own thing. And they're doing it concurrently and actually in parallel, unless they have to like, share a peanut butter jar or something. right? And if you look at this example from the perspective of actors, it, it starts to look fairly reasonable and fairly easy. So actors is a formalism where Concurrency is handled by message passing. And if you want state to change, you pass a message to an actor. So you can get a handle on an actor. And other people can have a handle on you. And if they want you to do something, they send you a message. But everything you do, you do in a single thread of control. You never worry about sharing state. So if we look at Ruby starting out as this um, free sort of form language, and uh, whether or not the drawbacks to mutable state and dynamic typing are as severe as they might be. And more importantly, whether or not Ruby is accessible to a lot of programmers. I think we reach this, this position that I have that quantity matters a lot. Having a few really smart people who can do amazing things with functional programming languages versus a lot of people who can do a lot of different types of computation is a really good point. If you saw the keynote yesterday, I think that um, the speaker made a fantastic point, which is that we shouldn't be so concerned about being rock stars and have such a level, uh, such a high standard about correctness, and you need to no uh, algorithmic complexity and a bunch of CSS mumbo jumbo inside and out, that a lot of people may just need to do a little bit of mutation of state to get something done, and that that empowers them 
uh, in a way relative to technology that they couldn't possibly dream of. They're never going to invest the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours that you would need to go read all these papers and learn the mathematics behind it. And it's another very interesting point that, um, that Leslie makes in his paper that the math needed to do computation well is actually fairly limited. It's just you know, some set theory, a little bit of understanding of functions, combinatorics, some basic logic. So basically what I would say is that for Ruby, we should embrace and defend those things that Ruby has because I believe that they make Ruby accessible to a lot more people than, uh, than would otherwise be and that the dangers of things like dynamic typing and mutable state may be easily offset with something like actors or looking at correctness. If you can describe something more simply, like this transition of states and a simple predicate, can I check that this thing is true at each transition? That possibly becomes a lot easier to communicate with people and teach people than um, some abstract theory of recursive functions so that you can do you know, a map over some data structure to collect some values that very quickly starts getting a little bit confusing. And finally, the, the last thing I would say, and I've, I've really struggled to understand why I, um, I see functional and declarative programming being more difficult for people. And I think that one of the things comes down to the fact that there's a, there's a fairly large distance between where you declare something and where it has an impact on computing that value. And that distance is almost zero when you're looking at an imperative programming language where you say do this and then you say do this and you compute this value. Every effect tends to be right there. If you take out you know, the possibility of shared, concurrently mutated shared state, by using something like actors. It becomes a lot easier to see the locality and reason about it than something like a, a functional language where you, you, it's nice to have these definitions, but if you've ever worked with like a constraint language or, or worked with a constraint program where you're, you have some arrangement of things and you start modifying a constraint and everything has to update, it's really hard for us to think that way, think about all those things that have to update to make that result Right, where if you say move this here, then move this here, sort of turtle logo style, it might be a lot easier. So what I see with Ruby is that this, there's this, this openness, right? Dynamic typing is a, is a very open um, discipline that says how you behave is more important than what you are, which I think is a pretty cool thing in real life as well, that it's not necessarily the end of the world if you do something a little reckless sometimes, like eat this delicious looking thing. And that we can describe computation possibly more effectively to a lot more people by talking about state and mutating state than by ab fairly abstract functional stuff. So Ruby is great, but Ruby has a problem. I mean this literally. Ruby is a giant hack. Mots was interested in programming languages, and he started hacking on something that he ended up calling Ruby. And then some other people got interested, and they started hacking on something that continued to be called Ruby. And the hacking continued over a period of years. And recently, Ruby 2.0 was released um, based on the same code base that's been hacked on for 20 years. And what Ruby doesn't have is anything approaching a specification. And a specification is fundamental to understanding what something essentially is. Now there is an ISO spec for Ruby that was created a few years ago. It tries to cover both 1.8 and 1.9, so it doesn't cover much of either. And just like any written specification where a human being who can make mistakes and make them at a rapid rate reads something here and then goes over here and does something with it, um, like we saw with CSS conformity uh, you know, on older browsers and things like this, it's really hard to read something and then translate that into something precise. So that's one of the major things that's uh, addressing, or, or major problems that Ruby is facing uh, right now. Uh, looking at Ruby from an open source perspective, I thought that this was a, just a funny tweet. How many people have read the, read the Cathedral and the Bazaar? A lot of people, that's pretty cool. So I am atheist, and I was a bit weirded out, but um, I had plenty of people assuring me on Twitter that I wouldn't be like lightning bolted for my heresy or anything, so it was a Unitarian church. 
But Chris Epstein, who's one of the maintainers of SAS, is a pretty hilarious guy. And he's like, what, the bazaar is in the cathedral now? Yeah. So in terms of, of Ruby, this is one of the things that I, that I want to look at. And we're going to look at the implementations of Ruby in just a little bit. But my thinking has really changed a bunch in just the last year. About six months ago, I gave a talk at RubyConf called Toward a Design for Ruby. And it was a talk about the challenges that Ruby faces from the perspective of all these implementations that are trying to do one thing and having a unified language. And for all the time that I've been working in open source and using open source, excuse me, and way back to you know, this, this paper, I think that open source has had this perspective of um, anti-business, essentially. That open source was more of a social thing. That we got together and, and did things for the good of something greater than ourselves, perhaps, or because of our interest in learning something. But that business analysis, typical business analysis, did not really apply to open source. And I think what that perspective has lost is this idea of enlightened self-interest. And if you look at the idea of enlightened self-interest and you read um, uh, some economic theory about that, I think that it's a very powerful idea and I think that it's an idea that's missing from a lot of open source. One of the fundamental things about that is this idea of a market. Uh, if if we look at open source as just a bunch of people that get together to do something good, then we don't necessarily look at economic forces that impact that um, activity and how uh, effective that you can be, what sort of things you accomplish. Now, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, or one is good or one is bad. But what I'm saying is that looking at open source merely from the perspective of, uh, you know, a social organization and do people sort of, you know, do they get along, do they like each other, do they work well together, do they make this thing, do they like the thing they're making, versus looking at it from a market perspective where you do something like say, well, who is going to be my customer? Who is going to trade value, right? We typically look at this in paying money, but who's going to trade value, something that they have a value for something that I'm doing? And this idea is becoming more and more uh, important to me in, in the context of Ruby when you start looking at market segments. This is an amazing picture. Flickr's Creative Commons search is, is pretty fantastic. So we've got Pepsi and we've got Coke. And fundamentally what we look, we're looking at is a market segment, right? And market segments aren't necessarily based on absolute value. No, no one I don't think can actually make a, um, a defensible position that Pepsi is better than Coke, or Coke is better than Pepsi, right? Like, what would your standard be? They're both soft drinks, so in the market for soft drinks, there are different segments. Some people like Coke and some people like Pepsi. But why people like Coke or why people like Pepsi, you can look at that. You can look at where, you know, age groups, who likes Coke and who likes Pepsi, how much money they make, demographics, these sort of things. You can look at, you can start to examine um, those things. Now, what if we applied that to open source projects. In particular, I'm interested in applying that, that way of thinking or that perspective to Ruby as a language because we have a bunch of implementations of Ruby. I'm going to go through uh, some major ones right now. These Venn diagrams or attempt at a Venn diagram, um, the, the disclaimer is, excuse me, relative size is not really representing anything. What I've tried to show by overlap is how likely it is that these different implementations would be used in the same environments or the same context, right? So real quick, we'll run through these. JRuby is um, one of the first alternate implementations of Ruby. And by the way, there are, uh, not hundreds, there are tens of implementations of Ruby. If you get a chance to look at Konstantin Haas's, uh, he's done a talk a message in a bottle. I think he has the slide in that where he looks at all kind of like 75 some different implementations of Ruby that he found. I, I thought that was his best. No, no, it's a, uh, excuse me, yeah, um, Ruby and Lisp, you know, I don't know. Um, no, it's good, it's, it's all good. So JRuby is one of the earliest um, alternate implementations, I, I should say just implementations of Ruby other than MRI. 
JRuby was a port of MRI C code to Java, which is not a crazy uh, you know, mismatch. And uh, I think it was started around 2001, so it's been around for quite a long time. Um, the, it was an attempt to take advantage of the stuff that you have on the JVM. So you've got typically a good threading model, good garbage collectors, just-in-time compilers, lots of platform support, lots of libraries. And I think that the overlap with a lot of what uh, MRI can do is pretty large. And there's also stuff that JRuby can do via the Java integration, access to other Java libraries that's, that's significantly outside of what MRI is possible, or what is possible under MRI. Uh, kind of all the way on the opposite end of the spectrum, I think, is MacRuby. And what's interesting to me about MacRuby, MacRuby was an implementation that made a decision to break compatibility with MRI in one key area, that passing arguments, so that they could more naturally match uh, Objective-C, which was their, really their target. It was a way to do Objective-C programming. So I think when I start looking at, I start looking at Ruby in terms of markets and segments, I see MacRuby as, as really the first segment of the Ruby market. And what's really interesting about that is MacRuby really doesn't overlap with a whole lot of other stuff. MacRuby in its current uh, um, uh, incarnation as Ruby Motion, is, it's actually possible to write Mac OS apps and iOS apps with MacRuby. So, at the time, I was fairly dismissive of MacRuby's um, uh, maybe relevance in a way, because they weren't really trying to be suitable for all the other places that people were using MRI. Certainly people aren't writing Rails applications in MacRuby. <clears throat> but from the standpoint of market segmentation, they're actually really interesting because they broke a little bit of compatibility to open up a much wider realm and they didn't destroy Ruby in the process really. Right? They're continuing to work, they're continuing to go strong, and they're, they have their own uh, pretty significant segment that's fairly um, non-intersecting with the rest of, of the Ruby stuff. Iron Ruby is an implementation on top of the CLR, right? So a lot of uh, code ported to C Sharp. And there's pretty significant overlap, right? There's a lot of stuff that, that pe there, there are projects, even Clojure at one point was trying to run on both the CLR and the JVM. So there's some, there's some significant overlap, I think, with, with areas that JRuby addresses. And also, uh, they you know, support a lot, of, a lot of MRI. So uh, an interesting market segment that's, that, that has a lot of overlap with both MRI and JRuby, but really they're their own thing. You know, it's like there's, there's stuff that's an advantage to being able to integrate very well with the CLR. Uh, Maglev is an interesting implementation based on a Smalltalk virtual machine. And again, I don't think that they overlap a lot of what the other implementations do, but they provide really good uh, potentially really good integration with Smalltalk and the existing uh, Smalltalk systems out there and maybe open up Ruby to Smalltalk and vice versa. Uh, Topaz is a very recent implementation based on PyPy, uh, the, essentially the, the PyPy technology, not PyPy itself, but RPython and the ability to describe a virtual machine and then as I understand it, you sort of get a just-in-time compiler for free and so they're implementing a bunch of uh, Ruby. They're doing a lot of it in, in a, basically a dialect of Python. Uh, there's a lot of overlap with MRI. There's a, they certainly, um, at this point, aim to be quite compatible. They are using Ruby spec as much as they can, and they're increasing that all the time. Um, they don't have a, uh, I don't think they have a position yet on a concurrency model. They're not supporting threads as far as I understand it. So again, I don't see a lot of overlap with other implementations, but a fair amount of overlap with uh, contexts or environments or situations when you might, where you might use MRI. Opal is uh, an implementation in JavaScript. So they're attempting to make it possible to run Ruby in your browser. And um, in that, I see some overlap with JRuby because with Java and Java applets and stuff, you can potentially run uh, Ruby in your browser and overlap with MRI. Um, they're uh, 
so there's a project called ASCII doc that's apparently written in Ruby and they've ported it so that it's basically running under this now. So you can, you're starting to be able to do some pretty powerful stuff with um, uh, Opal and Ruby in the browser. And, uh, and then this, again, the size is because I'm trying to overlap a bunch of stuff. Um, and the disclaimer is, yes, I work on Rubinius. So my views might be um, biased. Uh, so Rubinius attempts to address almost every situation where you might want to run MRI. We support C extensions. But we um, also have worked really hard on better technology. So we have a generational garbage collector that has shorter pause times and more efficient memory use. We have a just-in-time compiler that we're constantly improving to uh, in, um, increase the speed, the execution speed of Ruby. Um, a bunch of Rubinius is written in, uh, in Ruby. So the entire core library is essentially written in Ruby. The bytecode compiler is written in Ruby. We try to bring up as much stuff to be easily and idiomatically accessible in Ruby as possible and push that, that layer where you transition into some sort of machine land as far down as we can. Uh, and we have no global interpreter lock. So your, your threads will run. Uh, we handle concurrency well, and your threads will run parallel if you have the hardware to support it, which is becoming fairly common. Excuse me. Um, I think that Ruby is suitable in a, in a lot of uh, other places. It's, it's possible, I don't know that someone's actually done this yet, that you could compile Ruby with M, uh, M scripting, which uh, you know, turns a, like a C program into a giant uh, bunch of array accesses and uses JavaScript's uh, typed array stuff to run C programs in the browser, so you can potentially do something like that. The technology stuff, I think, overlaps pretty well with um, JRuby. Microsoft is actually making some pretty interesting changes where you can write uh, native windowing stuff without using C Sharp, without using .NET, um, and then various other things. So in some sort of overlapping fashion, this is, this is what I see uh, sort of looking at Ruby as a programming language and looking at implementations as, um, as sort of addressing different segments in that. So Ruby, to me, is, is really a, a market. Ruby, the language, is, is a, most akin to a market. And uh, one of the really interesting things that you need for, um, uh, for um, I think, for a market to work well like that is uh, standardization, right? So if every time you went to buy a lamp, you had to double check that the plug was going to actually work with the outlet that you had in your house, that would be really problematic. Just like if you're writing Ruby code and you're using MRI and you're like, hey, I want to actually try this on JRuby, if you have to go to a lot of effort to, um, to change things around, uh, then you, uh, you're essentially wasting time, right? So standardization. It's both an artifact and a process. We have the artifact pretty well handled in Ruby spec. We have literally tens of thousands of examples of Ruby code and what we expect their behavior to be that is easily run and is run by every major implementation of Ruby. The process is something that's very problematic. Uh, like I said, I gave that talk on the, toward the design for Ruby. and. The goal was to convince MOTS and the MRI core developers to collaborate and participate and move sort of the locus of design from Ruby from being a few people hacking on something and deciding at some point that they're going to release a new version to collaborating saying Ruby has to address all these sometimes very different contexts. So let's specify Ruby. So specification and standardization are distinct. They have some overlap, but they're distinct. So let's specify Ruby in a way that we can uh, create the biggest uh, overlap in the standardization as we can. Right? Let's push the areas of incompatibility as far out as we can and make it possible so that um, Ruby as a market can function very well. So you aren't concerned about where uh, you're going to run your Ruby when you're writing it. You just write Ruby code. And you're like, hey, you know what? I have a JVM at work. Uh, they only let me use JVM. So I can install JRuby, and I can play around with Ruby stuff. And maybe I can start using Ruby in my work environment and show people it's not this dangerous language that people think it is. If you have to worry about tweaking minor or, or 
sort of irrelevant incompatibilities, that process becomes much harder. So accessibility, it's a sort of potentially issue of accessibility. And what I really want to do is avoid wasting time. There is a lot of problems that need solving and you know, changing something to match some other behavior that itself might not be well specified, right? It may be a hack on something else, not, not just MRI. Someone else was hacking on something. They made something work. There was no way to test that they were compatible, so they aren't going to be compatible. So porting software is a valid, um, I think, use of time and effort, right? There may be things that are available on a platform, like I've ported software from Windows to Linux before, and I've ported software from Linux to Windows. Based on what the, the context that the software needs to run in, other tools, there's, there's a lot of valid reasons for porting software. But what you don't want to do is generate a lot of waste. You don't want to be spending time doing things that you don't need to be doing. So that's why standardization is super important. So we need a specification for Ruby. For Ruby as a market to function well, I think that we need a specification. We need to understand what the thing is that we're trying to build so, because a market needs to have some sort of consistency, right? Drinking Coke or Pepsi versus drinking beer, right? Yeah, that's market for drinks, but it's pretty different, right? If someone's going from drinking Coke or Pepsi to drinking beer, they're sort of exiting one market and entering another market. So we need standardization. And looking at Ruby from, this, from the standpoint of markets and market segments, instead of just a bunch of people getting together to do this collaborative social thing, I think has value. And finally, where, where we're going with Ruby. What Ruby needs are tools. We have very, very few tools. And what's interesting, I'm starting to see people talking about uh, refactoring IDEs for functional programming languages. Uh, for a long time, people thought that you know Ruby is so easy to write. You really don't need an IDE. You just an open an editor and do some stuff. And you had this other camp, you know, coming from C Sharp or Java, where you have like pretty sophisticated tools. And they're like, man, what are you talking about? You know, it's like uh, that's pretty hard to do. But that divide has been pretty significant for a long time, right? Ruby and Python. And there are people that have written uh, IDEs and editors, but the tooling around those things has been fairly primitive, I think, and really not that widespread. I mean, I know there are, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank, but there's a, there's a major editor that, uh, what's that? Komodo. Komodo, yeah, there's another one that I'm thinking of, but RubyMine, yes. Uh, thank you. So RubyMine is, is one that has some pretty sophisticated stuff, but I think what we fundamentally need are tools, and they're not just editor tools, but they're understanding the lifetime of our program. The um, execution characteristics. I write this thing and then I deploy it out here and I write it and I have some intuitive sense of what it's going to do, but what, again, you know, where's the disconfirming evidence? I think that this is going to perform well when I throw a bunch of stuff at it, but what, what evidence do I have that tells me that's the case? Well, if I could look at how my uh, program behaved while I was running the test, say, locally, and compare that with how it's doing in production, for instance, one of the things we use in tests a lot is we use mocks or stubs. Well, if I mock something on an object and my test passes, that mock has a certain uh, signature. And I look at it in production and I'm like, hey, you know what? The objects that are going through in production don't have this method that my mock has. That's a no method error waiting to happen somewhere potentially. We don't at this point have any tools that would tell you that. So I think tools are, are a really, really fundamental part of, of Ruby. And I think the next thing uh, is, is related to that, but, but also this thing. People are a really important part of the future of Ruby. This is a picture of, um, I'm pretty sure if I have it right, it's Rails Girls um, DC. Uh, there's a bunch of these around the world. Um, there's some cool um, summer of code projects going. But we need more people. And this goes back to what I was talking about with uh, Leslie Lamport's paper. Teaching programming to people in a way that's accessible to them and doesn't, um, you know, gives, empowers them. See, what I see in terms of technology is that the ability to program is becoming a literacy issue, right? Basic literacy uh, can have a tremendous impact on your quality of life, right? Well, basic literacy, when we look at it from the standpoint of being able to control automation, program computers, understand what's going on, is creating sort of a new divide between haves and have-nots. It's a te technology itself can be um, a leverage, right? Steve, um, um, 
Jesus. Uh, <laughs> the Apple guy, what's his last name? <laughs> Steve Jobs. <laughs> Steve Jobs, uh, his, his thing about the bicycle, the computer as a bicycle for the mind, right? We need, to, we need to bring that tool to more people, right? Empowering, empowering more people. So people and tools, I think. And then uh, as people work with Ruby and find problems with it, at the first point that you hear a problem, stop and really listen to that problem. Don't be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, all you just need to do is get blah, 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 blah. No, listen to what that person is saying right there because they've encountered something that's like literally turning up a little diamond in some topsoil. And you're like, we tend to brush right over. And it's like, oh, yeah, I got that handled here. Just run this command. The fact that they had a problem is uh, very likely means that many other people had that problem. And it's an opportunity to make Ruby and the accessibility of Ruby much, much better. So um, like I said, I think Ruby is a giant market. Yes, it's a giant hack. We're working really hard on proving that. I think it's a giant market. And I think that if we look at everything, right? The future has certain characteristics. Ruby has a lot of things that make it a great language. It's got problems. We can address those, right? We need to work more on specification and standardization. And if anyone's interested in helping with that, please talk to me anytime. Um, and then what we need to focus on are tools and people. We need to make Ruby easier for people to use. We need to get more people using Ruby. And then we'll build tools. And it's a pretty, pretty cool, cool cycle. Uh, just a few places where you can find me. I work on Rubinius, uh, created the project Ruby spec under Rubinius. We spun it out. All the major implement, all the implementations that are doing anything with Ruby right now use it. I'm working on version two of it to improve it in a lot of ways. Um, an interesting note is that it's not uh, blessed by MOTS or the MRI core developers. There are MRI core developers that contribute and have contributed to Ruby spec over time. But it, is, it has no special significance. No one, you know, MOTS doesn't say, OK, as long as it passes Ruby spec. When MOTS or other MRI core developers go to hack on features, they do not write Ruby spec first and, and then say, OK, let's see, this is how it should work. And now people do it. We're constantly playing catch up. And it's a very frustrating situation to be in because, like I said, even people who don't particularly like me, and there's, there's plenty of personality you know, conflicts in any, any community, they still use Ruby spec because it has significant value in being able to say, are the things that I'm doing when I'm programming this breaking things? Are they doing the same things that MRI, are the developers that are going to go use this implementation of Ruby that I'm working on, are their programs going to run? So in Ruby version, in the Ruby spec version 2.0, um, I'm actually taking a fairly significant step. And I'm saying that MRI is no longer the reference implementation for Ruby. Ruby spec is. And as we improve Ruby spec and more and more people who are implementing Ruby use it, then it becomes the thing that people refer to. And it I want it to become the sort of definitive way for people to understand both what Ruby does, because Ruby is insanely complex. Almost weekly, if not daily, someone's like, hey, did you know this method did this? And I've written tons of Ruby spec. And I'll go look at it, and I'll be like, what? The who, what? Ah, and for which argument combinations and stuff like that? It's just Ruby is, is, is pretty amazing when it comes to complexity. So Ruby spec is a, is a big endeavor, but I think that it's, it's really essential to, to improving Ruby uh, for everyone. And then some personal projects are there, and I'm bricks in pretty much everywhere. And that's all I have. Thanks.